from there. You want to just get that? Yeah, I think it'll be a little easier to see this if I set it up as such. So um, I'd like to start off by providing this, uh, in this talk a, a overview of kind of what we're about. Um, then, then what I'm going to do is highlight sort of three uh, specific social science slash empirical legal studies examples uh, of ongoing uh, projects. I think that these projects have sort of pedagogical value, research value, but also uh, potential payoff. Some of the ideas here are payoff for end users of legal, legal information. And so um, even for the folks at, let's say, at uh, LexisNexis, some of the information visualization, for example, that we're, that we're going to show is a way to help end users be able to uh, mediate the crazy amount of content that they have that they're confronted with. Um, and then I'm going to hand the floor over to Mike, who's going to uh, walk through various sort of uh, uh, components which might be enhanced using uh, law.gov style information. That'll sort of culminate with a sort of list of possible questions um, that, that uh, Carl asked us to compose, which are just ideas of, of research projects that would, be, that would uh, sort of aid folks in the academy, but also potentially people who were interested in doing things like business analytics or something like that with a sort of law flavor. Um, so with that, I just want to start by providing a little orientation of where we kind of come in on uh, all of this. Uh, we're sort of involved in this big, big data uh, uh, era. And for those of you not familiar, uh, it basically goes like this. Increasing computer power, decreasing data storage costs. They're fundamentally uh, changing the scope of scientific inquiry. And um, this, this point has been highlighted in, in a number of recent publications. Uh, special edition of Nature, uh, uh, paper in Science, and just even just a few months ago, in The Economist had a 16-page uh, special report on the data deluge, as they call it. And so I think that this sort of uh, is a bit of a game change for, for those of us who are interested in, in studying law and studying uh, political and legal systems. And so uh, what I'd like to offer is where we come in is we're interested in using computational techniques to try to study these legal systems at a very, very high, high level, but also be able to use these techniques to drill down on particular things that we're interested in. So it's, it's not, it's not uh, sort of with the traditional distinction in, in, uh, in the social sciences is qualitative and quantitative. It's both qualitative and quantitative, but, but it's using data at a scope that, uh, uh, that hasn't really been, been used in the past. So it got, legal systems have a tremendous amount of information. We just showed, even in Texas, just the examples. Now, if we think of the 50 states in the union, we think of the federal government, we think of all the municipalities and so forth, it becomes a very large corpus. And the question is, do we have methods at scale of the size and scope of this information? And so I think that very quickly, you say, well, this is impossible in human time to actually go through all this. And when that sort of takes you right into, comp into computation, into computing. And so... Uh, we run a blog with this title called Computational Legal Studies. And what we try to do on, on the blog is just highlight very, there's various people around the country and around the world working on various components that are associated with applying computational methods to study legal systems and political systems more generally. And so, uh, you know, it's about large end data analysis. I just want to highlight, just so that I'm on the record, it's also theory, theoretical models, mathematical models, computer simulations, and things like this are still part of the puzzle, too. And one of the reasons this is the case is you, know, you only have one run of history, and so the data that's generated from a particular process, you can't ask questions about counterfactuals. Well, what if the world was different in this way just from a stream of data because the world was the way it was and the data was generated on that, on that state of the world? And so it's important that we all, that I just want to be clear that their theory still has a place in all of this, but what ha theory ha theoretical uh, offerings have not changed in the way that data has changed in just, say, the last three to five years. But just on this point, I just want to highlight, like those of you might be familiar with like Thomas Schelling's social segregation model, this and other work won in the 2005 Nobel Prize. And the point is that's a theoretical model that makes empirical predictions that we can test using data. Say, and uh, out at Michigan, um, Mike, for example, works for Bob Axelrod, and he has this evolution of cooperation model, which is a game theoretic model. Uh, and you know, perhaps Nobel will be in his uh, future very soon. So for law.gov, we see this as being a very exciting possibility because you know, high quality authenticated data is what we need to do this type of analysis. And there's a lot of social science and legal studies questions that we can evaluate, but the, the, the key is that uh, uh, we need the data. And so I'm gonna walk through, as I mentioned, a few projects, but, and then we're gonna sort of culminate with this master list. But here's just a few things. That, and these are more pitched at the federal level, but this could just as easily be 
uh, in line with the discussion that was, uh, that was had earlier today. So I'll just highlight our first project that uh, we're working on as we're studying the United States Code. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with it. Here's a picture of it on the shelf. Uh, I tried, I did my best in law school to never craft a sign on one of those, but uh, you know, but here I am studying, so the joke's on me, I guess. But uh, uh, for those who are not familiar, you know, it's the compiled version of federal statutory law, and it's compiled in, in a way, manner similar to the way a computer program is compiled. So there's changes being made all the time. Statutes at large are the sort of chronological uh, ordering of, uh, of bills passed by Congress, and then they're compiled in this object of the, the United States Code. It's important to note that these do not include ad administrative regulations, but um, notwithstanding, uh, you know, these, some of these titles in the code are pretty familiar to folks. Um, one going on right now is the census. Uh, another one that hopefully you've ma made some arrangements on is uh, Title 26, the tax code, right, Internal Revenue Code. Uh, other, other ones would include like the well, labor law of the United States, public health and welfare, so forth and so on. So for, for us, we think this is a very interesting way to get a scope on, a, a perspective on the scope of law in a modern society. So ask, we could ask some very basic questions like, well, how big is this thing? How big is it? We can see how many pages it is. We can see how many books it fills. Those are basic sort of starting points. Another question you could say is, well, how complex is this? And how is that, how is that complexity or scope changed over time? And there's a lot of anecdotal accounts about things like this. There's not a lot of science about this type of stuff, I have to say. That's what we're interested in doing. We want to study these objects in a way that would stand up in a, in a scientific peer-reviewed publication. So here's another question we could ask. Are changes in the code coupled with changes in the administrative state? So how are regulations, which supplement and, uh, and sort of integrate with the code, how are those been changing over time? So I just want to make the point, if you don't accept my premise about computation, about the scope of what we're, something like this that we're talking about. So here's the first page in the United States Code. Page one, open the book, here's what it looks like. If I take that and I just, we'll just take that and let's make it yellow. That's just so we can keep track of that page. So now I'm going to take that and I'm going to move it all up into the corner. I'm going to fill the entire page. I'm going to fill the entire stream of pages. If you did that, that's, that's already getting to be a, quite a serious project if you want to read it all. That's going to get you something that's roughly equivalent to labor law in the United States, federal labor law. But, you know, that's not how large the code is, right? So if I take this and I push this up there again, right, this right here would rep this right here is our page, right? It's getting pretty hard to see up there. And I filled the whole screen now, that's the United States Code. And so again, the point, the, re the, 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 the visual demonstration here is meant to reinforce the, pre the principle that this, if you want to study this at population level, you're already moving it into a space that, uh, now I think I have a lot of folks here who may already be in agreement on this, but just in case there's a holdout, uh, you can start reading, we'll, we'll see you in quite a while, uh, if, you're, if that's the direction you choose to go. So how do we measure these objects? So I just showed you kind of a visual demonstration of how large this is. How do we, what, what's the approach to measure an object like this for, in terms of complexity? The first thing is you need to generate a mathematical representation of the object in question. That's just a sort of jumping off point for anything like this. Um, and then you need to come up with a qualitatively justified manner to, to, to measure that representation. So I'll start by talking about, well, how would you think about this as a mathematical object? Well, you have to say, well, what are the features of the object in question? One thing that obviously jumps out at you when you look at the object is it's got a hierarchical structure. So, you know, that's not news to most people in here, but just, you know, a 501c3 exempt organization is a specific claim to, to traverse a hierarchy from 26 all the way down to C and then to 3. And if, and that, if you looked at that, it would look something like this. And actually, this dramatically understates the amount of hierarchy because this is only going to the section level. And so if you went deeper, there would just be more rings and in greater depth at different places. But this is just to make, give you an idea. Now, in terms of an end user, perhaps this would be an easier way to navigate this than to see those screens with a, with a layer. This sort of a visualization, if it was interactive, might be a, a better way for them to have a handle on where the content is structured. This is just a, you know, I put that out there as a possibility. But this is the first of sort of component of, of an object like this. It's not the only one. One thing that the code has is citations, and that has to be dealt with. 
So just as an example, like let's say the ta let's say tax evasion. The tax code may go in and reference criminal criminal procedure when talking about tax evasion. So it's a tax question, but it's like, well, we need to rely on principles that are developed in Title 18. And so there's this dependency between components in the object, and that has to be represented as well. And so when you that take this example and you then iterate over the whole code, it looks like that. That's actually what the citation network of the United States Code looks like. And if you go online to our blog, you, this is fully zoomable, and you can go in and you can look at this, OK? And this right here is fairly modular. That's the tax code. So the, the tax code has references, but most of the references are internal to the tax code. Now, some of them are, are, are not. And so this component that's kind of on the boundary is spanning across. But again, if you want to take a look at this on your own, this is, uh, this is available. And again, visualization is a way to help deal with the complexity that's out there to help end users. Right? So if, even if you don't care about the research side of this, you say, look, for an end user, this is perhaps a much better way, a more intuitive way for them to experience something like this. Um, and the last, the last component, and there are subcomponents under these, but I'm not going to go into too much depth about them, um, is the linguistic content. The code has about 24 million words as of uh, just you know, fairly recently here. And you know, that's represented on those pages that I showed you earlier. So um, we have a couple papers where we begin to sketch out how to do this representation. The first one is um, under review of Physica A, and it, it basically describes that this in a, in a formalized way. And um, this other paper, which really just explores the properties of the citation network, is, is under review at European Journal of Physics B. Both are available on the Physics Archive. Um, and, and, our, and our blog, there's a portal to the Physics Archive at the top of that. But um, those are sort of the setting the stage in some sense to this question of complexity. And one of the things we're interested in is the complexity of law and the complexity of society and the way those things are moving together. So we have this paper under review, or, or in progress right now, where we actually try to, and that's more for a general audience. The other two are pretty technical papers, but this is for a more general audience where we try to measure the object and provide uh, some sort of an in-depth explanation for these things. When, when we do that, these factors still come up. These are the three factors. And I, I just see sort of legal studies as going in this direction. To deal with something like that, you kind of at least need to have some familiarity with a lot of different things because it really calls upon you to think about applied math and law and computer science and linguistics and psych and political economy and lots of other things. And so that's, that's sort of our perspective on things. But this is an example of, of, of one, one project that we're, that, that we're currently undertaking. We can ask questions. We can ask questions like, how is the complexity of law and complexity of society co-evolving with one another? And we can do it in a way that's, that, that, that really has measurements involved in it. And if people don't like the measurements, they can write a, you know, a follow-up. And that's, you know, that's like science, right? And that, I think, would really be exciting. So we're, we're putting that out there uh, uh, to the world. So another project, which is probably just slightly on the boundary of things that law.gov might be about, but um, just an example of when you make data available, things are possible. One of the exciting things is things that you, we can't even think of now, if you put that information out there, you know, there's a lot of creative people and they can come up with stuff that you would never even contemplate, either with that data stream or mashing it up with other data streams. They can say, well, I'm going to use this over here and this over here this and do some sort of novel recombination. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a whole other avenue here and that's one of the reasons that having that information could be really exciting. So we've been, uh, a project I've been working on uh, uh, thinks about uh, net network analysis of federal judges. So the basic idea is, uh, and I probably don't need to really el elaborate this to the group here, but we're going to use these colors going through. That's the hierarchy of the courts, and these colors will be consistent throughout. So one, this is sort of the question I'm interested in, social topology. How, even among judges, there are, you know, there are superstars, and then there are just other judges that kind of come and go. And so we're interested in, well, why did this person become a star and not that one? Why is this person the one that shows up in every case book and not that one? Why is this person the one that's always discussed and not that one? So the question is, is can we get a measurement of something like that? So uh, what we did is we went out and collected uh, law clerk information. And we did that from 1995 to 2005. And uh, we went out to the staff directories that are produced. Now, one thing we can imagine that for every judge, that basic information was made available. I, this is not currently within the scope, I think, of law.gov, but this is just a proposal. Of, that's, this is nothing, nothing serious. Just make the names available, and we can use those, that information to, to show the social connections between individuals. The basic premise of the paper is this. 
that in the aggregate, not at the individual level, not at one particular transaction, when you study law clerk movements, sort of as a physical system, you just watch them all moving around, that that sort of tells us, that reveals social and professional relationships between people. That any given year, maybe a person will move between somebody, but over a wide window, like 10 years, those patterns uh, sort of uh, merit out in a particular way that there's, there's actually something going on underneath the hood. And so, um, you know, that, that's the core claim of the paper. If you don't buy the core claim, that's fine, uh, uh, but, you know, let's just show you what that would look like. Maybe, maybe you'll buy it then. So, so this is something that people, at, uh, I'm sure here at the Career Services Office uh, at Texas, I know at Michigan, they spend a lot of time thinking about this. They, they said, well, we want to we wanna help our students get these clerkships. And, and what we'd really like to do is get our students a clerkship at the Supreme Court. Well, how can we do that? Well, we know we, we have these two justices, which might be the end point. But they don't just hire people straight away. Oh, well, one thing we might learn over time is if you go to Judge A, you can get to Justice Y. That's the kind of, that's the gateway to Justice Y. Another thing you might learn as you study the information, as they collect information over time is, and this is constantly changing, right, because the judges are going in and out, but you might learn at a given moment, Judge B will get you to Judge Y, or to Justice Y, and to Justice Z. So we might say, well, I don't know if I can get to Judge B directly. So, oh, well, I, if I go to Judge C, you see, I can get to Judge B, and then maybe I can get to Justice Y or Z. Maybe me, maybe not, but at least I know that there's a path. The, maybe I'll make that path, maybe I won't. Same thing, you might learn something like this, these paths, and more and more of these uh, as you go on. And maybe there's regional aspects to this. There are, in fact, other aspects like this. But these, this is information. Now, I'm not, there's been a lot written about this. I'm not interested in the market for clerks per se. I'm interested in using all of that to, to learn something about relationships between the judges. Not, I, I'm not so invested in clerks. I'm not trying to help them get their clerkships. That's, that's for other folks to do. But, but I think we do learn something in the aggregate. So let me show you what that looks like. That's what it looks like when you take the 10 years and you visualize it as a network. And so what you have is this really dense core here of individuals. And then you have this sort of periphery. One thing I think is interesting is there are, there are components within the periphery which are still interesting. Like right here, you see this? There's all this flow into this individual. From there, there's only this one path that gets you in into there. But there's all these people trying to flow into this person. And you see a couple more of those on the boundary. As you get to the center, though, there's, there's these really, you know, there's this dense core of, of individuals. And um, there's a visualization algorithm that generates this. It's not, it's not our, our uh, it tries to minimize energy configuration. I could talk about that offline. But I think this is what you want to see. You want to zoom in and look at, well, who, no, who specifically are we talking about, <laughs> right? So here's just an example. Now, I just want to highlight that this data ended at the end of the natural rank list court. So the point was, let's hold the Supreme Court constant for 10 years, no changes at the top, and let's see on what's going on down below. So one thing that jumps out on that is somebody like Soda and Soda Mayor being one of the key feeder judges, and you see this here. And if, if you do some graph statistics on this, her name jumped out. We had her name on a list. People will have generate these lists anyway. But this is a sort of not just a, a just so story because I say so story. This is like this, if you just were to look at their behavior, they're saying she's one uh, exactly where you might find her, sort of left but very close to the core. Um, here's Merrick Garland, a name that's been mentioned uh, for as a possible nominee of the Supreme Court. There's Alex Kaczynski, nice circuit judge, Judge Posner. Thurman O'Scanlan, and then there's Sam Alito right there. And again, he's green then because he was yet to be elevated to the Supreme Court. So I think, I mean, if you didn't buy the claim, I think this lays out pretty much like people's intuitions, but it does so in a, what I would argue is a more neutral framework. We're just using this data to try to get a handle on who's who in the federal judiciary. And this lays out like, if I told people, go ahead and write down where, the, where, where this all lays out, I think this looks very familiar. So again, we can learn something about, about the system with this type of information. This probably wasn't exactly what people thought was going to happen when they put those names in that directory, but this is the type of things that are possible. And uh, if you're interested, this paper's online. It's a working paper at Michigan Law School, and it's coming out in Ohio State. So if, you're, if you want to, all this stuff's available online if you want to check it out. So the last thing I want to talk about is exploring the path of precedent, judicial citations. And um, so, one place we can study those, an obvious starting point, is to start with the United States reports. And, you know, like here's a page, here's Bush versus Gore, page one. 
Uh, from a case like this, you know, there'll be citations in the case. And in this instance, it's similar, it's a similar approach, it's a network approach. And in that instance, here instead of being judges, the, uh, the nodes are cases. And the edges are citations, and they're directed. They're from case one to case two. I'll show you a very concrete example of that. It's a case decided in 2000 called Dickerson. It cites lots of things, but one of the things it cites is Oregon versus Elstad. Right, so the case has one to n citations. Might have tons of them, might have a few. This is one of the cases it cites. It, it cites. And Oregon versus Elstad cites Miranda versus Arizona. And not surprisingly, this is why there's cl clustering in the graph. Dickerson also cites Miranda versus Arizona. And so this is a trivial example, but the point is just to, is just to highlight what is actually going on. When you see these great graphs, what's actually the individual components are made of? And one thing I just know, and, and as a point of differentiation from a social network to a, to a citation network is, time is, these are acyclic graphs, meaning basically time runs the opposite direction. There, are, there isn't these close, the triangles don't close. And you kind of already knew that in, in the sense that Dickerson here decided in 2000, can't cite a case in 2005, right? So, so time has to run sort of strictly in opposite. I mean, maybe something could be decided on the same day and then you get into this like, ordering problem. But as a general matter, that's a fundamental property of these, these types of graphs. And I'll show you in a minute, that produces a lot of problems for us as researchers because of most of the good methods have been developed for social networks, not for these types of graphs. So I want to show you what potential payoff here would be to study the path of precedent and the way it develops over time. So I'm going to show you a dynamic visualization of the early years of the court. And I think you get a very different perspective when you see things in their time. We see the cases in our time looking back, and we think about what's meaningful now. But if you see the, the, the decisions in their time, you get a very different perspective about what's important. Oops. Okay, we'll have to do that one more time. Bonus opportunity. Okay, so, so we have this movie here. Hopefully it will show up. Uh, okay, can you see it in the back? What's going to happen here is they're going to be green when they're cited. The year is going to be at the top. The year is going to be changing. And, and it's going to be rotating. It's in 3D. And what you'll see is in the early years of the court, there's very little citations in the largest com weekly connected component of the graph. There's very few citations. They're citing things, but they're not citing their decisions. They're citing English law, French law, legal commentators like Blackstone. So in the early year, there's very little structure to the graph. I'm labeling major cases just, just to give you anchor points, like Marbury, the Charming Betsy. What you'll see is the graph doesn't have very much structure, and these cases are kind of at the boundary. Now, this is all going to change. The first sort of cluster of cases decided where they cite their own precedent in a heavy sort of way happens in the 1816-1817 window, and it involves a set of maritime cases. So in just a second here, this graph is going to really start to take off right there. Okay? And these cases here are, are maritime cases. They build off of ideas in the Charming Betsy. Other cases begin to link to them. They start to become a central cluster in the graph. And what happens is, again, these cases aren't cited very much today, but in their time, the time in question, the year at the top, they were core cases. If you look at the citation network at that moment, you get a very different perspective about what's important. By now, Marbury's starting to become a central case, but it wasn't a central case at the beginning. It was just on the boundary. And now as time's going forward, you're, you're starting to see you know, this graph's already getting very dense, very fast. This is like watching history, and it's like a two-minute version of 35 years here or whatever. But um, the idea here is now you see like major cases like McCulloch and so forth. And at this is available online. You can watch it again if you want to. But um, the idea is through things like this, you, it's a way to demonstrate these ideas, these ideas of, of what's important and when it's important, and, and to sort of pull out our biases. Our biases are to look now and look at the, look look from here back to them and say, oh, this is this important case, but if you look at it in their prime, you get a very different perspective about what's important. So um, that's a, another possible project, things that one can do if the data is available. As I mentioned, we have this problem. We have this problem that we have these measures, good measures for studying networks, but mainly social networks. Graphs like this are much more tricky because of the lack of, of cycles. So we, we're developing. Um, this method, which I'll talk about in one second, called the sync method, which tries to work on these problems. But this is a visualization of Marbury up to right now. 
call it the six degrees of Marbury versus Madison. The way this works is Marbury's in the center. The first ring here are cases that directly cite Marbury. The next ring are cases that cite cases that cite Marbury. The next ring is cases that cite cases that cite Marbury, and so forth and so on. And so you're, this is sort of uh, analogous, but, but importantly distinct, as I mentioned, uh, from a social network. But it's similar to like your, your second and third degree friends on Facebook or something like this. And so the idea is we call, what we call these, this thing is a sink. And this paper is also at Physica A on a revision. I think we're going to hopefully, knock on wood, get, get through on that one. Um, the idea of a sink is this. If you, you want to, we want to understand the origin of particular legal ideas. We want to see the cases in which they begin. And we want to see, we want to trace where those go. So the idea of a sink is, if you turn the flow instead of away from the case, if you turn the flow back to the case, if you started at the outer rings and you said, well, where would this all flow? Where would it all drain? It drains to the sink. It drains to the center there. And the center is Marbury. So with that sink, you can create a distance measure between a case. You can say, how similar using the citation network alone We'll talk, I'll talk, mention that we want to use linguistic analysis and marry those up, but just using the citation, we can say, how similar is the citation profile of this case to that case? And we have lots of cases here, so that's going to be, need to be done in an automatic, automat, automated framework. But we can create this sort of a dendrogram, which shows the sort of nature of relationships between things. The payoff for all this, say, okay, I, I'm not sure what the payoff of all this is. The payoff is that you can color the graph like this. You can color the network and you can tell the difference between components of the graph. So this here, these components, when you look at the network, they look like they, should, they belong together. But if you use this method, you realize they're actually, they, they share a higher order relationship, but when you drill down, they, don't, they aren't the same. What they are is, they're all related to this maritime admiralty cluster, but they're distinct in this respect. One is about sort of private international law, private law and a little bit about criminal law. So it's about torts and contracts and, and, and criminal law associated with um, prizes, taking of the ships on the high sea. So under the prize statute of 1812, you, and subsequent prize statutes, but under that statute, you could take a prize. You could take a ship under the high sea under certain conditions. But if you violated those conditions, you may have committed a tort. You may have committed, uh, you may have impaired somebody's contract, and now you owe damages to the person who to do those goods were to be delivered, and you may have committed piracy. And that's what one of those components is. The other component is also a, a, a prize related matter, but it's about the commander in chief power, the president, the scope of Congress's authority to write the prize statute. So again, they're all about prizes, they have this higher order relationship. But when you drill down, if you read the cases, you'd say, no, no, these belong in separate cupboards, right? And this is what's exciting is. This method is, allows us to distinguish between things like that in an automated framework. And that, I think, and this is why we submitted something like this again, because we think it's a bit of a breakthrough. But you know, time remains to be seen. One of the questions with something like this is, how does it scale to the whole, to a bigger universe of things? But the idea is, maybe we have a bit of a breakthrough here. That's what we have to work with, ultimately, you see. It's non-trivial to go to the whole set. There's like 30,000-ish cases. So I, that graph we showed you is much smaller than 30,000. That's what it all looks like, actually. This is what, what, what era, that all the sites go backwards in time, right? Where, where do you cite? Do you cite yourself? So if you look at the Rehnquist Court, do they cite the other Rehnquist Court decisions? Do they cite one turn back? Do they cite the Burger Court? Or do they cite one of the other courts going backwards in time? So this is just a way to represent that, to think about that. But this is what I mean about scaling. You've got to ask yourself, with these methods is, do they scale to huge graphs? Do they scale to large bodies of data? If something works on 100, 500, 1,000, does it work on 30,000? The answer is not always clear. But this is just, uh, we'll have more documentation on this graph um, online soon. Here's just some other fun stuff. This is the direction that we really like to go in the future, which is, the, is linguistics. Marrying up language and citations to do this sort of detection. And like here, here's an example, and this is, this is not like a serious study or anything, but it's just, if you look for the use of the word, you take all, the, all of the uh, cases and you just look for the tokens, like abortion. This is the word frequencies over time. It's basically, there's a little spike here, but there's almost no mention of this stuff, and then there's tons of it, right? I mean, that's, that's like, like goes critical, from nothing to critical, 
right? And then you see property. And again, this isn't something that would be super serious, but the idea here is this sort of tracks westward expansion and the railroad cases and things like this. And maybe there's a second moment here associated with intellectual property and things like this. But again, I haven't, I don't, don't, don't quote me on this second moment in particular. I'm not sure. But the idea is that would be the place to jump off to do, to drill down and look very carefully at. So, so I've offered you several examples of possibilities. The idea is these are only meant to be emblematic. So maybe you're interested in something completely different. But this is the type of things that are possible. It's really only the beginning. We can unlock the vault. A lot of things could happen. You know, but the key is the data. We've got to get more high quality data. And that's why we're so excited about Wadak. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike now. Uh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. This sounds so interesting. Are you all gonna go international too and you're you know looking over everything? It seems like a good way to predict the uh, growth areas for practices that you know in firms are trying to make a balanced um, offering. Yeah, I, one place is that we, yeah, we've been very interested in applying some of these methods to other, other jurisdictions. Um, you know, maybe start with common law countries. There have been similar analyses done in some countries using, a lot, using ideas that, that, that we are also drawing upon. There's methods that are being developed uh, in civil law countries and in common law countries by researchers. I think there's a group at Sciences Po, I'm not positive about that, I think it's Sciences Po in, in France that's trying to work um, to use these sort of ideas. I know that there's, there's, a, uh, there's a group in Austria, there's a group in the UK, um, there's a group, I believe, in Australia, although, again, um, I'm not positive about all this, but the, the idea would be, yeah, one thing is, if we want to talk about general, general, general patterns or universality, we need to get a compar comparison to other jurisdictions. If something holds across jurisdictions, then you might not be able to make a claim about universality. Something. I don't know if they're universal. If anything here holds outside of this case, but the only way to know is to look. So. Are these citation... Uh, analyses built off public data, or are you borrowing a private data set? No, these are these are based off of public public information, but it's public information that we had to spend a lot of time uh, is it, is gathering. It now, or is it, it is public now. It is public now. To, to try something different with your data. Yeah, I mean, the stuff is public. Um, for example, one place is um, our last author on the one paper is James Fowler, and on his website, he's a, a fairly prominent network scientist. You'll find. Um, uh, some of this data uh, is available off of this site, kind of towards the bottom of the page. Uh, he does lots of other things. That's just one place, but uh, in other instances, you know, this has been non-trivial. I mean, it, uh, um, I mean I'm, I'll have Mike come up in a minute. I'm, Mike is basically a professional programmer, among other things, and that it shouldn't be the case that, that we have to have, bring in a professional programmer just to do this type of analysis. In an ideal world, stuff would be made and available in a way, right, hopefully be a lot of stuff where we could really just start to actually do the underlying research and not spend so much time trying to assemble data sets and, and, and get them in reasonable formats that, that we can actually do work with. So that's the hope. On a, on a theoretical level, what is the difference or is there a difference between what you call computational legal studies and empirical legal studies? It's like empirical legal studies, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of ana uh, 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 analogies to that, but this is at a scope, this is, Generally, they'll use an out-of-the-box software, pro uh, a statistical software program or something like this. This is about going sort of another level up to that. So if that is sort of two orders of magnitude in terms of scope above that, but you could think of this as empirical legal studies just at a wider level. They tend to generally draw their, in their in influences from political science and from economics, and I would say we draw our influences more from computer science and physics than, than the other, but I'm in political science as well. So it's just, it's really, it's a, so I don't know if that's a distinction even worth imposing, but, uh, uh, but it's really about a leveraging developments in, in computing very seriously to do these things and, and less about uh, uh, just sort of using sort of out of the box uh, software. But again, maybe that's not a meaningful distinction. I don't, I don't know. Sure. I'll give you an example that would make a nice graph. I think um, one of my colleagues at Harvard a few years ago uh, looked for the word democracy in the Supreme Court database. First instance of use and how it grew. First instance was in the 20th century. Yeah, that's, I mean, and, and that's not what your intuition would be. You think no. it's, it's very early it would be, your, would be your, your guess. I guess one of the things when you look at the data, you find out sometimes that your gut instinct is not even close to accurate, right? And sometimes it is. It tracks very much what you already think. In some instances, you couldn't be more wrong. 
right? And this might be one of those one of those cases, I think. Um, so maybe I'll pass it over to Mike, uh, uh, who's a, who's going to sort of uh, take us through this other this other uh, uh, these other elements. So I'll, I'll I'll hand it over to him. Right. So these are clearly things that we've gone into some detail on. These are projects that we've carried through some some stage of publication. And we just want to step back a little bit, maybe synthesize the broad categories in which we really think we can actually bring empirical methods to bear on these problems. So again, here, uh, here are affiliations. And um, the way we think about these problems, there are sort of two categories of objects or dynamics that we are interested in. There's, there's law on the left there with statutory objects like the code or the uh, federal register and uh, analogs at the state levels. And there's also the whole set of judicial objects like cases or maybe more narrowly precedent or judges and their clerks and justices. And these are somewhat distinct from the study of the dynamics of disputes, right? So you have mediation. Maybe you have, uh, there are some databases of labor, labor mediation or arbitration, right, that you could analyze. People do this. There's also litigation more generally. You could think about how you might analyze the dynamics of litigation to uh, make better decisions in the process of either deciding whether to litigate or how to litigate or when to stop litigating. And so um, we're just going to present a few examples from each of these categories other than mediation because we really just don't have enough on that front at this point to be uh, very worthwhile. But again, statutory dynamics. Dynamics are what science sort of cares about. It's a basic conception, right? You need to think about dynamics in order to understand problems. So what might we be interested in? There's the US code, which we, we showed some, uh, some existing research that we've done on. There's the Code of Federal Regulations. Both of these only recently have been provided for bulk access download. And um, unfortunately, there's 200 years of these that we still need in order to answer a lot of questions. So you can get the CFRs right now in XML. You can get the US code, for instance, from Cornell's Legal Information Institute in bulk XML snapshots. They only have three snapshots at this point that you can get, though. So if you wanted to answer questions longitudinally about law as, as represented by the code or the Code of Federal Regulations, you can only do this over very narrow windows. We've looked at how we could actually digitize these resources ourselves historically, but then you have all of these issues that come up. So clearly, as we now have authoring platforms that are digitized going forward, we're OK. But if we're ever to answer these questions going back, we need to really think about these problems. There are also various other, uh, other statutory objects, such as state codes or things like the UCC or UPA that we might be interested in looking at, at uh, either over time or differences, for instance, between states, the minor. And um, right, so we have these. What questions can we ask about them? The first uh, is, as we saw last time, about the code. And again, uh, legislation at the federal level is a nightmare. We, um, we've done some analysis that's been in the Times on, for instance, the health care bill and all of the coverage of its length. And if, if you try and actually understand what a bill does, it's, it's an incredibly hard undertaking because of this process of drafting that is very sort of incremental instead of representing whole snapshots. This, of course, is in part due to the fact that some of these bills modify such, such a wide array of pieces of the code that it would be uh, an additional hundreds of pages, I think, in these bills by the time they were done. But three questions that are concrete that you could ask if you had all of this data, the US code and legislation available, would be, for instance, is the tax code getting longer? This question has been answered by page counts or by the CCH reporter, right? People give these statistics. The, another more interesting question is, are other parts of the code or are other agency rules using the tax code, Title 26 or 26 CFR, to affect policies, whether they're for any reason that people use tax, right? The health care bill is a great example of how Title 26 is being used as a policy lever to actually affect some kind of change in incentives. And this is a question that we're obviously very interested in. Are bills or just statutes in general getting more complex? This has ramifications if we continue to have humans draft law, right? Because humans have some cognitive limits 
And at some point, throwing more humans at problems doesn't really scale to the complexity of drafting or understanding law. And um, this, many of these go, go likewise with the Code of Federal Regulations, although there are some other interesting questions we can ask, like, are agencies creating more law than Congress itself? And is, has this changed over time? Is this something we, as a democracy, really understand, or should we accept this, or should we change this trend, if there is a trend? There are also more fine-grained questions that are clearly of interest at this point in time, like, does the SEC uh, act proactively or retroactively to market trends? For instance, credit default swaps. Should they have issued rules faster, or were they actually on time in, in sort of adjusting to changes in, in practices in the industry? Then uh, a question that we've um, really thought about, because tax policy is a very interesting thing in general, is can we actually look at the cost of compliance for businesses across different states just roughly speaking, through the analysis of state codes. So this is uh, something we've discussed with some individuals from Brookings, and they seem to think that it's, it's an interesting way to look at this problem. And again, if there were a central location to download standardized, normalized forms of state codes, this is a project we could have already done. We have all of the tools and conceptions and software necessary to attack this problem, but getting all of the state codes and trying to analyze them simultaneously is a, is a real pain. So we, we talked a little bit earlier about judicial dynamics as well. We, um, we have a couple different things like precedent, which is in some sense different than cases, right? Because cases might contain multiple precedents in some sense. And um, there are also judges and justices. And Dan previously showed uh, some study of judges and justices and their clerks. But we can ask other questions like, citation patterns, does a particular justice, not a term, does that justice like another particular justice's uh, opinions? Or how do um, intra-court citations reflect actual underlying uh, social networks in the court? So maybe we can tell which justices are really friends or not based on their citation practice. Some of this is clearly more academic, but some of this is, um, is definitely uh, useful either for legal history or for practitioners if they're looking for perhaps holes in precedent or places where it might be weak. And um, so the next category that we're going to deal with is litigation. And mediation, we don't really know as much about. We know this is clearly a, a large part of what many lawyers do in some parts of the market. And so if there were more mediation data available, privacy concerns aside, obviously, you could make much better decisions about mediating in some cases. Uh, litigation is similar though, right? So we might want to ask, when are settlements most likely to occur in the process of litigation? We just had the docket sheet. Say we didn't even have any of the pages after the docket sheet. Just the docket sheet with the list of events for each of these. What could we say? Now settlements aren't really recorded, right? But you could sometimes infer when settlements happen. And you could try and answer this question. You could also ask, what paths do cases take to get to the Supreme Court? If your goal is to get a case to the Supreme Court, there are obviously strategic decisions about where to file, how to file, uh, how to generate your case. And people have good intuition about this, sometimes where they have experience, but not always. So maybe we can help here. Um, this is something that we actually have worked on, and we don't have any publications uh, forthcoming for this yet. but. We have every docket from the tax court. This isn't easy to do. They don't allow bulk access. They even don't allow spiders anymore. But um, you, uh, you can obviously ask yourself, what are the courts that real American citizens are most likely to interact with? And the tax court is probably actually one of those courts where uh, an average Jew off the street might actually end up. They might actually take the petition. So you could ask, given your covariates about uh, what what's wrong with your filing or what kind of person you are or whether you're representing yourself pro se. Are you going to win or should you just settle? These are actually useful things to real people in the world. And sort of generalizing all of these is, can we really build a prediction model for litigation broadly? Could we actually give you probabilities of transition from state to state, from motion, some kind of motion to some kind of success or failure in a case? Because we, uh, we live, as Dan said, in an era where we have so much more data that 
we really should at least try to make more reasoned decisions instead of just relying on gut instincts or experience. Not that those aren't useful, but if we have the data, why don't we at least see if we can do better? So these are just a few of the ideas that we've come across in our, our few years here in empirical or computational legal studies. And this is just a, a simple summary of them. I, I think it'd be best if we just go to a discussion right now about any of these ideas. about the citation uh, to the same court. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the Court of Appeals, uh, the, there were nine judges, three panels, and the court at that time would cite any court opinion in Texas, any other Court of Appeals, or the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I made the argument that a court should first look in the interest of stare decisis or precedent, should first look to an opinion we had written, and we should always follow what we had written before we follow what us in other court. And it was it, it was difficult to convince, but ultimately I managed to convince the people to first cite to first court. Because if you don't have that discipline, then any opinion can can, can go in any direction no matter what that court has done. Uh, if they can find some other court somewhere that's done what they want to do. Right. So you really you really would like more certainty and sort of the, yeah. the jurisprudence that somebody might have to consider in order to make decisions about the litigation. And clearly that's a, a good principle if you'd like to make it easier for litigants. So that study is interesting about how, how you, can, you can grab that. Yeah, I don't know if justices or judges always use stare decisis in the opinion, but there are ways just by categorizing opinions and then looking at the citation networks to see which courts maybe do follow this principle and which don't. So this is clearly something that might go into a litigation model for predicting. If you know that somebody really holds uh, dear to them this principle, then you can guess which, uh, which cases or which precedents they're going to use in their opinion. So these are important things. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about looking at um, who gets overturned? Right. So this is a little bit harder because just purely um, traversing citation networks mm -hmm. won't get you the answer. You need to actually have something like uh, effect from Shepherds, for instance, or Key Cite, in order to say is this a negative or positive citation? And is Shepherds it to a dissent? <laughs> no. Right. So I think coding coding at Lexis has changed over time in some sense. But these are things, again, that other firms have added value on. Theoretically, you could train um, text classification methods to perhaps detect sentiment positive or negative in paragraphs with citations or sentences. This is not easy. Obviously, Shepherds, is, Shepherds and Lexus now have put a lot of time into doing this with lawyers on board, too. But for, for the public or for academics, this is perhaps a good training data set, but also uh, a useful useful thing. I mean, when justices are appointed, right, we always talk about when they were overturned. So people now have to just look, right? You just, maybe you can go to Lexis, you can type in the name of the justice, you can then go through Shepherds or something, find negative affect cases, but Lexis doesn't have Shepherds for every case. And you could, if you had access to every case, automate the detection of overturnings of justices like this. I assume you mm -hmm. can do a bibliographic citation analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's easier to identify the, the citation. And you then classify them by whether it's a journal or whether it's a newspaper article or whether it's Wikipedia or whether it's. I think that the answer it, varies. People have done that manually. But yeah, the answer varies. You can train a wide variety of classifiers or just set a couple regular expression patterns or build some kind of tokenizing or classification trees. But the answer is you can do pretty good with simple tools, but to get good accuracy, you really need humans or you need to put a lot more time into it. 
I mean, one, one of the things that we're interested in, I mean, at least inside the academy, is there's lots of claims about something like the evolution of the law. That'll be a phrase that's used a lot. If you want to take that phrase seriously, it seems to me this is the beginning of a, of a concept like that. And one that sort of an evolutionary biologist would actually take seriously is we need to specify fitness function. This is the things that go forth, and this is where the affectation is actually very useful. We need to know what things... So here's a question you might ask. Is a bad site... A, are, is all good news bad news? So what's the worst thing for a precedent? To never get cited or to be cited negatively? I'd like to know the answer to that. I mean, it, uh, I, if we want to talk about evolution of the law, we want to talk about what's fit and what survives, I don't even know the answer to that question. My intuition would be say getting any site is better than getting no site over some period. If you, and in some sense, you might say, if you haven't been cited for how long are you functionally dead? Maybe you'll be revived, right? Maybe it's, the, it's that this sort of principle only comes around so often, and it just doesn't get cited, and maybe, maybe there's some exogenous event in the world. Maybe something happens in the world and makes this case important again. But then there's cases that are in a space that constantly are, are being treated, and this case is ignored, and it's as if it's dead. But maybe it's never been given a negative cite by anyone. It's worse than negative. It's just not cited at all. I mean, if you look at the Supreme Court's decisions, just as an example, Something like half of them have never been cited a single time. Not once by another Supreme Court decision. Now, I'm not here to say they're dead, but that doesn't look like life to me. You know, Half of them never been cited once. So that's just an example. I and mean, that's a paper that somebody else wrote uh, called The Web of the Law. But um, uh, the, the interesting, all these citations have these flavors to them. They have a particular uh, sort of distribution associated with it. And again, that... That, that informs even, I think, our judgments about how, uh, from a pedagogical standpoint, how to, how to train lawyers is to say, look, you need to understand the landscape in which you're working. Most of the things aren't going to get cited at all. What, why do things become the things that get all the cites versus other things? It, like, to me, is, it, is something that is useful for practitioners. It's not just some academic point, although the academic point is about evolution. We're going to talk about evolution. So, so, so I just put that, I would put that out there. But you're, only, you're only talking about judicial opinion. That's right. Just just so, within that that so space. Ten years ago, it was a judicial opinion, and it hasn't been cited since. Mm -hmm. in, in subsequent judicial opinions. Right. It could be because it was so clear and absolute, and bang, everyone yep. looks at it and said, oh, no point litigating that." Right. No, and I it mean, it wasn't cited at the Supreme Court level. It could have right. been cited by. That's the right. Appeals. And see, this is the thing. If we had all that data, I could assess that at all levels. Right? I can say, it's not only not been cited in the Supreme Court, it's never been cited by any court in any jurisdiction anywhere. Then it gets to be hard. Now, it may be that this thing is bulletproof. It's such a good opinion. But that's not what we see often. We see burstiness. Right? We see patterns of burstiness that, look like, that work like this. Other, no opinion seems to have that flavor, generally. What happens is, is it starts to elaborate a principle, and people want to test the subcomponent principles in some hierarchy. So even a case that's really unassailable in some sense, still agglomerates just the citation in the sense that they say, well, in this prior case we developed this principle, now we're sort of need to, to question this sub-principle or what have you. So even in that space, it may not be the case. Now, maybe it is. Maybe it's just bulletproof and it never gets cited again. But. So, go back to the um, judge, judge, the clerk yes. pattern thing. And, and the next one. The, the graph. Yeah. This or the other? Uh, the other one. Okay. So we've, we've got a few outliers there that really don't connect right. to anybody, except for maybe just two judges back there. Yeah. Is it, this is, these are all federal judges? All federal. So the blue is district court, the green is circuit court, and the yellow are Supreme Court justices. So the general pattern is green tends to be in the center, not a huge surprise. Yeah. Uh, Blue tends to be on the boundary, but it's not uniformly the case. Now, one thing is, is I recognize right off the bat there's limitations. This is just clerks. Well, we, one of the things we want to do is study citations also. Do the citation patterns mimic this sort of pattern, or are they different in some way? So, so a lot of times people say, if you do citation analysis, I don't know if I really learn anything, because I might just cite you because you wrote this really good case. Or you just wrote about a case that's controversial or important, and it's nothing about you in particular, it's just that you happen to catch this case, and now I'm going to cite. I, you just end up getting cites. So one of the reasons we did this is we wanted to create some alternative way to measure the same sort of idea, and maybe other ones. The point is, is the more data you make available, the more we can test propositions like this. But I, so that, that, uh, 
Well, for instance, the isolated thing in the bottom of the center. Uh, oh, that little... You've got that, a green going up to a blue, going up to a green. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What does the placement mean? The placement here is going to be unrepresentative of much. Well, this placement is kind of heuristic and should only really be used on the largest loopy connected component. So the fact that this isn't connected to the rest of this stuff makes the layout algorithm sort of just throw this to the boundary. And the distances between these nodes no longer mean quite as much. So if they're not connected, it's not that's the if you're not connected <laughs> in some way, they, the algorithm doesn't really have a way to deal with that. But almost everything is connected. So the point is that little cluster there could be over here, over there, or over there. The one that's unconnected. Right. Could it could it go anywhere? The things that are connected but are placed for a reason. Is, the green one is below the blue one is below the green one. What is the so green one mean. those are actually two. This is a, a that's a sort of random property because actually there's there's the two and then there's the three and they're not actually connected. That's just what it does is it basically randomly places things that are unconnected. Oh, they're overlaid. They're just overlaid, and that there's no meaning to that except for just by random chance they happen to land there. But everything that everything that is connected, there is a meaning. That those meanings, those distances are based upon sort of this energy minimization configuration. I could. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't include the slide, but I can show you the, the process by which that graph is actually generated. It starts as a, as a big cluster, and what it does is it sort of zaps it with energy, and um, the, it pretends that each of the nodes have magnetic charges and, and that are trying to repel one another. And then so the more connections you have, those are spring coils that hold you together. And so the thicker the spring coil, the more likely you are to stay close. So if the spring coil that's in your mechanical pencil isn't going to hold anything together, the one that's on the back of like a 18-wheeler is going to hold you together. So the more connections you have, the more uh, other connections you have, the more you're likely to stay in the center. So anyway, that's a little background on, on, on that. But. So um, I think what might be really interesting here is thinking about what questions of policy we might, or problems. Like if, when you started to put this up, I thought you were going to also talk about, um, you know, judge performance or whether or not a judge is particularly effective in, in moving things along. And I wanted to share a story from the National Institute of Health. And they wanted to know which of the professors they gave grants to were more effective at using those monies to develop something that ended up having social benefit. And they traced the citations of their patents mm -hmm. all the way through, but they also use other sources of data. So they use news data, they use company financial data, and so I would posit that you probably are going to need other sources to really answer your questions, because Absolutely. there are so many impacts, right, to, to what causes someone to make a decision. It's not just going to be the legal part of it. No, absolutely. I mean, this, the point is, uh, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't agree with that more, I guess, is what I, I mean, I'm sure Mike would support. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, the more information. One of the really fantastic things, as I see, as I mentioned earlier, is that people can come and novelly recombine data sets in ways that you would not have contemplated. They take a thing from over here and over here. You would say, oh, that makes sense for that space, and that makes sense for that space. But you might not see that sort of recombination of two different data streams in a way that, that's meaningful. And so, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, this is really what I mean when I say this is really only the beginning of this type of stuff. But the key is, that would get that data out there in a way that each one of these projects isn't like an incredible undertaking in terms of just the data collection. And that's what it's been in some of these instances. Just to get the data, we spend months and months and months. And if it weren't that way, we'd probably be a lot, I'd probably have a lot more things to show you. So. I do want to make a point for Carl's benefit. I think, again, briefing is an important component to this, particularly if you consider bursting and, and the social network. Um, you guys are looking at citations, which in some instances may take years before they ever show up in an opinion. Right. Um, but, but briefing, particularly at a district court level and then at the appellate level, really shows sort of a social dynamic that's going on below the surface. Right. And so if citations are appearing, if statutes are appearing, if there, and in particular a lot of cases already come pre-tagged with you know, uh, classifications of what they are. Um, you could possibly see something development and possibly along in terms of, of sort of business intelligence. Where do we see areas developing in particular regions uh, simply because of citation network mm -hmm. um, and what's going on at that lower level before anything even reaches a sort of a published or unpublished opinion? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I was very interested in the thing you said earlier about using the briefs. Now, I realize that there's this, these ethical concerns, but just even you think from a pedagogical standpoint, what is it that makes a brief good? Well, if we had all every brief over a huge window of litigants, over large types of class of cases, we might be able to create, I mean, we may think we have a good handle on that question, but the answer might be a little bit surprising. And the point is, we may be able to think about some properties of things that are very successful over, and this is sort of the business analytics piece. And the, the other, uh, there's a very interesting paper that I would just highlight to people um, using Supreme Court briefs, but just as, a, as an emblematic example of instances where, this was amicus briefs as well, uh, where the court not only cites the brief, but without quoting uses language that's specifically in the kit, in those briefs. So you can automate the, the, the detection of these sorts of things using sort of like plagiarism type software. And they found instances where the court has just lifted whole text, strings of text and imported them. Now I'm not, I'm not here to send them to the hall monitor or whatever, to, but I'm just identifying that if you, had to, if you had to justify the production of this brief to, to the person who's paying for it, you say, look, the Supreme Court took this component and directly incorporated it. And I just think that it may be in a more uh, everyday sense, you could say the district court or the local court, you can see these instances where my argument was successful because you can see this direct incorporation. But imagine you do that on a huge scale, you can sort of think about, well, what is it the things that actually are successful, are persuasive? Maybe my Martin Little Holloway could go up. Yeah, you could be a superstar lawyer, right? Be in the magazine. I don't know. <laughs> a point that I would make coming from financial engineering and sort of algorithmic trading is that even small improvements in abilities to predict can have large impacts in high volume areas of business, right? So we might think that we're not going to be doing that much better than an experienced partner will do on this case. But every little percentage can add up if this really is a core part of your business. And so it's it's at least worth it to try to look at some of this stuff. That kind of segues to what I was going to ask you. How far are we from having sort of off-the-shelf tools that a savvy practitioner or lawyer could use to do some of the kinds of things that you all are doing with lots of data scrubbing and lots of analytics? If I had access to Lexus or West Data, I could have it in two weeks. So it's really the data, not the computational methods that you're using that is the hardware. Most of it is, is the data. If you assume that you have sort of stable systems and you can use, you can back test on history, or at least recent history, then you well, can the, do this well, stuff. That's easy for you, though. I'm talking about, yeah. I'm talking about somebody yourself. down the line here, or me, being able to, to do some at least I could, primitive I could, analytics with, with decent data. How far are we from that? I mean, at least for specialized parts of law, what I'm saying is I could back test this, develop some software that would provide an interface for you to answer, add, like sort of answer a few questions, maybe go through a decision tree and then tell you should you litigate or not, or depending on where you are in the process, should you sell or should you continue. That we need, but over time, the thing is that that would be developed and then, you know, there's always this question of using backwards data. This is what my point about runs of history and why you need theoretical models too. You can't just use data if you want to do this forward prediction always, right? And the question is over what window can you do prediction? And so anyway, it's also like, well, for certain questions, there may not be enough information to make some inference. But again, if we could make people 5% better at what they do, that could be very meaningful over a lot of volumes of transactions, let's say. Would, would your predictions take into account, though, the impact that your projections would create, right? Because right. If, you, if everyone became aware of the structure of judges and the best way to funnel to them. Right. This is Robert Lucas, the <laughs> Nobel <laughs> economist, <laughs> his point about, about you know, econo like these types of analyses that, that these, these, these sort of arbitrage opportunities be, become recap recaptured in markets. Well, the question is, do you want to be the guy who did that, or do you want to be the guy who was the following that? Uh, deadweight, too, right? Even if the arbitrage opportunity goes away, we're still a more efficient society, and we all have higher welfare. Maybe you, you subscribe to that kind of thing. Because it will, it will have changed the predictive model at that point, so you'll have to at least then, you know, read yeah. it. Well, people won't waste yeah, we'll time be around then, I guess. Then. <laughs> you won't waste time litigating something you shouldn't litigate. Yeah. Even if everybody's using it, people will be wasting less time, right? They'll be able to go home on Friday night. Well, I just, I also think in terms of the business development perspective, there's good and then there's valuable. And so your good briefs may have stood the test of time in their arguments, but perhaps your valuable briefs, certainly in large law, are going to be the rare ones that are discussing something brand new. That people who see this as a deep pocket coming about 
are going to grab on to those rare ones that you have found that have their own little spike in a certain core, and they're saying, that's, that's my next avenue. That's what I want to pursue. So I think there is a difference between the, the good and the valuable when it comes to your looking at those. And I would suggest, I, my, my statement wasn't about making value judgments. Right. It was just simply about you know the volume yeah. in which certain opinions may be showing up right. underneath. That Absolutely. Don't even make it an opinion. Or, right. You know, right. Particularly if you're in trial court, where yeah. Yeah. many of them don't write it. Right. Well, it's hard to look at litigation outcomes without looking at verdicts and settlements. Yes, right. that's right. Is that right. a part of the data? A lot of settlement data is yeah. not available. It's not no. to anyone. No, to anyone. no privacy. Right. Well, and I, and I had a recent conversation about arbitration mm -hmm. proceedings uh, with Carl Barrett. And it was just a, it was an issue of how valuable would arbitration information be if it were publicly available. Yeah. I mean, just, right. It would actually open the door to something that's very mysterious to many people mm -hmm. uh, and make uh, make settlement decisions a lot easier mm -hmm. yeah. than new. And it would make some of those very rich people much more uh, who spread the wealth because they you know, <laughs> very siloed and encapsulated. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I had a two-part question for you. If we were in a business school, and you gave this presentation, and I said, so are your peers in industry doing this? You'd be saying, oh yeah, the guys at Goldman Sachs are like way ahead of us. Um, and so I guess part one of the question is, are folks in the big law firms or in LexisNexis or in other places applying these kinds of techniques already? And then the second part of the question is, are you alone in the academy or do you have peers in the law schools that again, if this data were available, is there a large population of researchers just kind of waiting for, for better data? I, I would start with the second one first, and I'd say there are people. They're spread around. I mean, Paul would be, Owen would be one of the folks that I would identify, but there are people in various, various spaces, some people in information schools, some people in law schools, some people in political science, and even in economics and, and, and computer science. So they're spread, or they're, they're, they are spread around. There's not a heavy concentration of, of, of that. I mean, there's a bunch of people who do empirical legal studies, but that I, would, I would just note that I've noticed that IBM seems to have some interest in moving into this space uh, uh, as, a, as a subset. Uh, the one thing that they produced, uh, an interface you might want to take a look at, is something called Many Bills, which is sort of the follow-up to their Many Eyes uh, information visualization. What it basically is is to show you the structure of a bill, but it's mainly graphical, and then it pulls up the text. Now, part of the thing is we don't have a server that can feed that type of stuff. I don't have access personally to that. I mean, they have those sort of resources, but I see, I've noticed that IBM is, just as one example, is interested in this as a potential so Is it IBM growth. or just Martin Wattenberg? Is it IBM more broadly, or is it just... No, uh, I, I've noticed that the, the other, that's on the sort of visualization side, but then also in the, uh, um, in the sort of business analytics side, it seems like that, that this is somewhere they're moving in. Now, I'm not privy to what they're saying in-house. I have no idea, but it's just it's an outsider's view. I've noticed that, and I think that other firms, I mean, it seems to me that this is one thing where, uh, I mean, I'm, I feel folks from Lexus, I'll let them speak for themselves. Uh, I don't know what people do in large law firms on this question. I think um, they, I think they farm team out team. the work to other people is what Economic they tend to do. So I will say, if you look, IBM also has patents in the late 90s on uh, algorithmic analysis of like the tax code to generate tax funds and stuff like this. So it's something that if you're willing to look through the patent databases, you can see many ideas that many of these companies have at least laid stakes to, whether or not they've been something that's been implemented or that's profitable is a different question. So. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't know what Lexus is doing on this front. The one thing I would say it seems like a, their Lexus and Wessel are uniquely positioned to leverage the data streams they have and then sort of provide consulting services as a, as a, I don't know whether they're in the, if that's on the, on the, I mean, maybe you're not privy to even mention that, but it seems like an, uh, not an obvious, but something that would be worthy of investigation. But sure. Well, there, we certainly will work with particularly large law firms if they want to use their internal data. Yeah. But there, we do have visualization and analytic products that um, are, are well known or, you know, public knowledge. Um, if you want to look at the court link profiles, you can look at all of the federal um, docket information and find out a profile of a judge, what kind of cases they hear, how they decided things over time. You can find the profile of an attorney who's argued at the federal level for similar um, types of questions, and it's all, you know, makes nice pie charts and it's graphical. Um, where we've had the most demand, interestingly enough, is around our company data. So if yeah. you are trying to, there's often you know, issues of fact in the legal case, and knowing the um, 
corporate hierarchy of a, of a entity knowing the assets that someone owns or has a claim that they own, those are the places where you can find most of this because that's where people will pay for it. I haven't really found that there's demand for this. Now we're playing with a lot of this stuff in how you look at legal data, particularly if we think about the folks coming through law school now and the way they learn and differently than how anyone else in the room maybe learned. So, you know, that may come to pass, but right now we're, what people want to buy is not legal data in this visual way. They like the rest of our data that way. Do, do, you, do you have any plans to um, sort of produce in-house consulting services? That would be more, we will, we will do the data mining for you. That was kind of what I would, we will mine the data for you and just provide you input results using our data, not yours. Using our data, oh, to answer a question? Not just a question, but like to provide like one of these prediction models or predictions okay. about your likelihood of success, let's say, well, we in have, a space. Sure, uh, particularly around litigation. Right? Yeah. That's where people spend money, it's on litigation. Yeah, so they want to know before they take a case the likelihood that they'll make money on that case. Those kinds of services, the more data that we can pull into them, the better our prediction capability. I'd say they're nascent, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but sometimes, too, you, if you some of what you're telling and talking about intuition, it depends on the scope of your practice. If you're practicing in a county in Texas, you know all the players. Right. You know how that judge rules. You know you don't want to be in his courtroom. You're rather be in her courtroom. So it, it's really who are you arguing uh, or who are you aiming at? And I would say you're probably aiming at large law yeah. that has a national practice. And they've got deep pockets. They might be interested in paying. I will point out that I, as a small publisher, I feel like the key is dirty data. Um, lot of it, even if we can free it up, you know, finding a way to, to clean it up is the problem, which is really yeah. uh, then where uh, the large publishers have spent, spent the money making sure that that data is clean, but, you know, for, for good reason, they're not about to share it with us. Um, yeah. And uh, that, that, that's been one of the limitations, certainly, with our business, is how much time and effort we've had to, to put in just to clean up the data that we do use. Uh, this is actually a two-part question that kind of builds off of some other stuff that's already been asked. But um, just from my assessment, kind of looking at where publications are coming from, yeah. in this kind of, given this sort of a, you know, a, a definitional like this field you're in, a lot of it seems to be coming out of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, is that because, and I guess the second part of the question is, is that because data, is this more available over there? And if so, is there something that we could try to emulate as far as on this side? Or is that just... I don't know if it's any more available. I don't know if Mike, if you have any I thoughts on this. I think the data is is more available. It's a different kind of legal system, though, for the most part. I mean, the, a lot of what I've seen done over there, I've been to a few conferences, is is a much more abstract kind of research. I might argue that in the short to medium term, it's likely less useful to follow those paths that a lot of European research centers have followed. So maybe. 50 years from now, those will pay off. But in the short term, I think the, the kind of discussions we've just had about business analytics are probably much more feasible. So. I mean, there's a group, I'll just give an example. There's a group called, I think, the Leibniz Center in Amsterdam that is is a, a appended to a group, the Artificial Intelligence and Law Group. But I, I guess some of these I, I would definitely second the point of uh, Mike's position, which is, you know, these are fairly abstract, developing automated systems of reasoning and things like this. Which again could be very very useful. You know, maybe the machines will be really be in charge soon. I don't know, but uh, that's one thing. But this sort of more short term, you know, helping with my case right now, uh, I, I, I see a little uh, a little less. Of, I do think that that part of it is the, the training there for PhDs in is sent that they have PhDs in law that are centered on law, and then they tend to the one of the places they tend to go. It seems like at least with some of the groups is computer science first maybe economics, maybe some of these others, but they, they have more training in this type of space, so they're, in some senses, ahead on some of these questions. I don't know. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>